Good afternoon. Uh, we just want to welcome you to today's conversation. My name is Ali Mohammadi. I'm a member of Sidwell's class of 1994. I'm also the clerk of Sidwell's Alumni Association Executive <coughs> Board. I'm also a parent. I have two kids <laughs> at this school, a uh, seventh grader and a fourth grader. Um, the gentleman to my right needs no introduction, Brian Garman, head of the school. And we're here today to talk to you a little bit about the school's new strategic plan that was unveiled this week. Um, a little bit about um, how it came to be, what it signifies, and really what it means in this day and age. Um, this will be a conversational style, and so we'll open up, Brian. Good afternoon. Yeah, yeah. thanks for joining us. And uh, thanks to everybody for making time during lunch for this conversation. Um, Ali, I'd like to thank you for your incredible leadership in the Alumni uh, Association. Um, you've been doing great work there, and you also were uh, an integral, integral member of the strategic plan process, serving on the steering committee. So um, I'm going to ask you some questions sure. today, too, uh, about how this process went. Sure. So good. Thanks. So we're excited about this. Uh, it was, this is the culmination of about five years of work, um, four years of work, where we went through the um, self-study process and surveyed our community extensively. Um, uh, about their perceptions and needs, and um, that uh, included surveys of students, faculty, parents, alumni. Uh, we brought in two separate organizations to do um, uh, extensive uh, SWOT analysis of the school. And uh, this work is really um, the culmination of that research, a, a response to that research. As you know, uh, as a member of the steering committee, we presented all of that to you, um, and then we uh, thought collaboratively about how uh, we might best approach some of the challenges that, uh, that the um, uh, research laid out for us. Yeah, and I think for us on the steering committee, what was particularly exciting about this was kind of the moment of time, in time, that we kind of embarked upon this. I mean, there's yeah. obviously a lot going on in the world, uh, right. globally, that goes without saying, but also kind of the opportunity to shape the plan around the fact that the school had recently made a purchase right. of the Washington home and it really has this opportunity that yeah. I think was unlike any other in this generation. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's uh, maybe more than um, a generational opportunity. Uh, somebody has called it a once in a century opportunity. And to, to think about um, the opportunity that we have to shape the school uh, to benefit to benefit our students uh, for coming generations is incredibly exciting. I, I, some, I tell people that I can't believe that we have this opportunity. So we have this once in a lifetime opportunity in a particular context too, which I think we try to articulate in the plan. And you were very good at representing this view um, on the steering committee that, that this is a time that is calling for Quaker education. This is a time that is uh, ripe for the kinds of values that Sidwell Friends um, holds uh, uh, to be at uh, uh, the very heart of who it is. And um, the ideas of um, equity, of critical thinking, um, of, uh, of uh, deep listening and dialogue and appreciating dialogue. So um, you and others, both parents and alumni, uh, trustees who were on that committee, uh, were very clear that you wanted us to drill into our Quaker roots. Um, and uh, I think that's exactly what we should be doing right now. Absolutely. Agreed. So as everybody can see, and if you've seen the plan already, really there are four kind of pillars really upon which the plan was built. Right. I was wondering if, you, Brian, you'd be willing to kind of start diving into those and, and kind yeah, of let so us know what you're thinking. Right. So the, the opportunity is incredible to unify the campus. Uh, that's incredibly exciting to our faculty. I think it's something that will provide tremendous long-term benefits to um, our students and our families. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, the opportunity to have everyone on the first camp uh, on one campus since the 1930s, uh, and it's sometimes hard to articulate to people um, why that's so important because it's so obvious to us as educators. To have all of the, um, the teaching faculty on one campus and to be able to communicate effectively with each other every day will have a tremendous impact on the quality of the student experience, both in terms of transitions between divisions and in terms of the kind of curricular discussions uh, uh, that they're able to have. And, and actually also the kind of discussions that they can have to support kids. Uh, we, ha we can have better continuity of knowledge about each child as they move from one division to the next. Another uh, huge uh, upside to unification is the fact that um, we can be more efficient. 
it's much more efficient to run on campus than two. And uh, a lot of the feedback that we received during uh, or through the surveys that were part of the planning process mentioned a concern with the cost of independent school education. That's true not just for Sidwell Friends, it's true across the city, uh, it's a national issue. So how can we find ways both uh, to contain cost and curb our reliance on tuition dollars? Are, uh, these, are, these are key areas that we um, heard about from our constituencies and, and uh, two areas that the board is very focused on. And, and so we really see the move to one campus as a, a step toward longer term financial sustainability. I think also the sense of being um, a friend school in the nation's capital carries with it a certain kind of responsibility. And so coming back to the uh, nation's capital gives us a better chance to serve it. It makes us more accessible to um, various communities uh, across the city. And um, we see that very much as, as part of our mission to help uh, uh, to serve and to engage the community in a much deeper way than we had before. I know that was part of uh, the work that you were doing on your committee, thinking about how we could uh, really turn outward a little bit as an institution and engage um, uh, in a responsible manner with the Washington community. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we were, I was a member of a working group, a subset of that steering right. committee whose charge was to identify, as way, identify ways and think about how it is important or what the importance is of being a Quaker institution in the nation's capital. And again, at this particular yeah. moment in time, and I think, you know, from my standpoint, there's the opportunity to lead. But what we heard as well, and what I think is wonderful about the strategic plan that you see is really Quakerism is so rooted in the ability to listen. Right. And at this point in time, and I think with what's going on in the world, I think perhaps we can lead by listening, by taking in what yeah. others are thinking. and. I think this yeah. opportunity presents that. I think also as a parent, what I would say is it's exciting the notion that you're going to have kids from pre-K through 12th grade yeah. on one campus. It's a I great mean, thing. First of all, I mean, as a lower school parent, there's nothing more exciting, for example, than Founders Day for the kids yeah. when they get to be on campus and see the, the bigger kids. But from a curricular standpoint, you know, the ability to have really one contiguous con curriculum that starts from pre-K and ends in 12th grade and you really see how that follows through yeah. rooted in Quakerism, I think is yeah. fantastic. It deepens the sense of community that we have too, uh, just having parents on one campus and seeing what's about to come, um, and whether it's a middle school or upper school, seeing the trajectory that their children will take here. Uh, and, and seeing the entire parent community, which is such a special uh, contributor to who we are, um, the people who care so deeply about the school and its mission. Back to your, your um, comment about listening, uh, it's when I think about uh, the current state of public dialogue, I, I worry about our uh, ability to teach kids uh, to notice nuance and to communicate in a nuanced manner. Everything is so Manichaean, everything is so bifurcated um, that if we can't, as a friend school, uh, find ways to have uh, our kids find a sense of a meaning, find some common ground, then we're really failing um, as Quaker educators. So we want to uh, open that dialogue here and are really committed to uh, making sure that we're following up on the, on the deep Quaker notion of listening. And that segues nicely to the second pillar, which is education. Yeah. Um, you know, I think as an alum, you know, you go on Facebook and what gets the most hits, what gets the most comments is a picture of a beloved teacher, you know, whether it's an Ellis Turner. Throwback or a, Thursday? Uh, well, it can be throwback yeah. any day, really. But I mean, you know, and what's beautiful as a parent is that so many of those educators value their experience right. here that they stay. I mean, you think of the Jeff Golds who are still at the lower school or Ellis Turner, Mama Duguay, Sally right. Selby. Faculty. Sally keeps coming back. Have you <laughs> noticed that? We're not letting her get and away. I, and I keep getting luckier and luckier because <laughs> my kids keep having her. Um, but you know, faculty really yeah. is the common thread that brings all of us alums together. So I was thrilled to see that this has become such a strong pillar yeah. upon which this plan is We have built. incredible faculty. And, and one of the things that really distinguishes Sidwell faculty is the relationships that they form with students. And those, I mean, you're mentioning this right now, these relationships go back years and years. Um, it's not uncommon for um, our faculty members to have emails from uh, students who are working in some area of research that a faculty member, uh, uh, in an area that the faculty member taught them, and they reach out to the faculty member for some advice. Um, they reach out uh, during uh, moments when um, they're experiencing uh, family crises uh, in their adult lives. And so it, it, these relationships are extremely meaningful. And it means that we've got to get 
the right faculty here um, and ensure that we continue to attract the kind of faculty that we have, the kind of people, exactly the kind of people we were talking about who are willing to make an investment in the community for a long time, to make an investment beyond just teaching the subject but to forming relationships with students. Uh, and so we have a couple of plans for that. One is that we need to build endowment so that we can ensure uh, that um, our teachers are paid at an appropriate national benchmark. Um, the cost of living in the district has increased dramatically over the last decade, especially housing costs. Uh, and so we're concerned uh, about paying our faculty a level that they can um, have a good life in, in the district and to live closer to the school because the further they live away from the school, the less time they have um, with their families, the less time they have uh, preparing for classes, the less time they have with students. So um, that's a fundamental um, uh, strategy that we have in the plan is to try to um, uh, create um, a system of compensation that assures that we're uh, getting the very best faculty. Uh, a, a second uh, item that is incredibly important to our faculty and always has been is providing professional development opportunities for them. Our faculty are lifelong learners. Uh, they want to give the kids the very best experience they can, which means that they want to be able to um, expand what they're doing. They want to be able to uh, uh, imagine beyond the limits of uh, what uh, uh, most teachers are bringing to the classroom. Um, they want to travel, they want to, they, they want to um, uh, continue to do uh, research in their field. We have a number of faculty members who do that, um, continue to write and publish, um, even though they're not in a university setting. So how do we think about uh, providing those opportunities for faculty? We are looking to create a faculty development center, a research and development center that is modeled after the Red House at Georgetown. This is a excuse me, an incredible uh, uh, initiative that they have at Georgetown University. They're trying to imagine what does the future of uh, a Jesuit liberal arts college look like? Um, it, what, what will Georgetown look like in 2030? And what they've created is an in, what they call an invitation from the top down, an invitation from the president to uh, inspire uh, creativity from the ground up so that they're asking um, faculty, what are the administrative structures that are blocking the kind of teaching that you would want to do? Is it um, the schedule? Is it um, the perceived barrier between the university and the community? Um, is it that you have a particular course load or you have to work in a particular framework of three credit hours? And so that if we broke those rules, what might teaching look like? What other kinds of opportunities might we be able to provide for our students? Would we have more community-based activities? Would we have more research-based activities for our students? Um, what if we had a different schedule and moved outside of, in the upper school, say, 45-minute uh, classes? If you had longer blocks, what sort of activity uh, might you um, be able to engage in with kids? So. Um, we have sent several uh, faculty to the Red House. We're going to send more faculty to the Red House. And really, the goal of the Faculty Development Center is to unleash the imagination of our faculty, which is really powerful and considerable. And I'm, I'm very excited to see uh, what they um, come up with once they have the opportunities to do that. Yeah, and it should be mentioned again that there were a number of faculty members who sat on the Strategic Planning Committee and in the right. working groups, and their, their uh, take on this was really taken into account, which was wonderful to see. There was about 60 people in total in the strategic planning process outs outside of the steering committee. So it was a very inclusive process. Uh, and we have faculty um, right now thinking about, okay, what, what should this center look like? Um, what are the uh, uh, kinds of initiatives we would like to see come out of the center? What is it that is going to be most useful and appealing to faculty? Um, so it's really uh, to support what they think uh, their teaching should look like um, five, ten years from now. A similar program that we worked hard on in the Strategic Planning Committee that kind of pivots to the third um, right. uh, you know, core piece of this is uh, develop a program that looks to be developed around strengthening the kind of Quaker yeah. ethos, in, instilling leadership qualities into yeah. students. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. So the uh, strategy is inspiring ethical leadership, and Gail Krotke, who is uh, teaching the ninth grade studies uh, program in the uh, upper school right now, is actually teaching a course called Ethical Leadership. So all of our ninth graders are taking uh, this course right now. How, what does it mean um, to act eth ethically in the world is kind of the, the, um, 
the undergirding question of this. Uh, and I saw a beautiful example of ethical leadership among our students earlier this week. Uh, some people probably know about the Texas mini-mester uh, that we did that last year. It was an incredible project where uh, Bert Nadler and Andrew Callard, two middle school teachers, took a group of um, our students to uh, McAllen, Texas, which is located right on the border between uh, Mexico and Texas. And our students worked in a shelter that serves uh, immigrants who have just uh, come into the United States, who have just taken that long journey across Mexico and um, are actually uh, you know, exhausted and, um, and bereft in many cases when they arrive to the States. And, and so um, our, our teachers and students were involved in um, a, a shelter where they're actually caring for those people as they arrive. And also, um, they volunteered with another group that uh, is focused on um, building homes for newly arrived immigrants. It's almost like, a, think about it as like a kind of uh, habitat for humanity. And we have built a relationship with these two organizations in Texas. And our uh, students who did this trip while they were in eighth grade invited representatives from those two organizations, the shelter and, and the um, Habitat um, group, to come to the school this week um, and to speak about the work that they do to share it more broadly with our students. And one of our ninth grade students at the end of the presentation said that what she learned from this process was that every day she had an opportunity to make an impact on the world, right? by being kind to someone, uh, by, um, by smiling at someone, right? by listening to someone. And we want our students to have that kind of consciousness, that kind of consciousness where um, an act of leadership, an act of compassion, an act of empathy can really transform a moment for an individual. And then how do you take that energy? How do you take that consciousness? How do you take that caring? out to the world on a broader level. And so um, we would want our faculty and our students to look for um, leadership opportunities that speak to the values of the school. Mm -hmm. So for example, one opportunity that I think that we would have out of that leadership center would be to collaborate with a homeless center that the um, city is planning to uh, build down on Idaho Avenue. And it's not just serving that um, organization or collaborating with that organization. It would also be working with students to understand the root causes of homelessness, um, to understand the history of it perhaps um, in the District of Columbia. So that it's not just a, a, a kind of um, noblesse oblige kind of service, but it's one that is really rooted in an understanding for social justice and the complicated social network uh, in which we live. Um, in this city. So that might be an opportunity. Um, it might be um, an opportunity to build um, uh, some advocacy for immigration in the United States within that um, leadership center. Uh, the faculty are working on that right now, excuse me, trying to figure that out. They'll engage students. Um, but this notion of uh, teaching students to develop compassion, to develop, to develop a sense of caring is something that we need in the world more than we need probably anything else right now. Um, so academic excellence is important and Sidwell is deeply committed to that. But academic excellence always has to, has to have a conscience because if we don't know what we want it to accomplish at the end of the day, um, knowledge is pretty meaningless. Uh, and that's really, I, I think, one of the things I admire about you is you've used your knowledge in a very responsible way um, and you have, as an alum, a, a sense, an obligation that you, are want, you, that you are going to make a difference in the world, uh, to use your talents uh, to make the world a better place. And we're hoping to lift that up. And what I would say as an alum is what's exciting about this particular opportunity is you know, so much of what we were taught and really what made the Sidwell experience different from any other, obviously there's the whole, that it's all imbued in Quakerism, but it's specifically that we were taught to let our lives speak. Yeah. And what's exciting for alums is this is an opportunity, I think, that really will call upon us to come back 
yeah. to the community and to, to instruct or to teach or to show current students we want that. how what we've learned has gone out into the world and made a difference. We want that. And um, you know, our alumni are inspiring. Uh, and as a, a high school student or a middle school student, lower schooler, you don't necessarily have a sense uh, yet of what you can do with your life. You have, you have different in your head sort of models, career models, career paths. But how the, the kinds of path, uh, twists and turns that those careers might take, you don't know. And, and you don't know necessarily um, how somebody uh, might work for social justice uh, in a way that someone might, might not expect. I mean, I think about, uh, you know, Vanessa Rubel, who are one of our uh, alumni who has uh, organized the Women's March, right? Uh, what a great role model for our kids, uh, you know, and they don't know uh, they don't think about that as a career path, uh, and that opens up possibilities to them and um, and how they might think of their lives. Uh, there's the, in this. I mean, it, it, we we're, we're we are excited about the center because it speaks to what matters. Uh, I think that I, I worry personally, both as a father who's going through this right now, um, and and watching our kids go through the college process. Um, and what is it that really matters? What are we teaching them if that is the single, if we present that as the single most important goal of high school? Uh, Harvard School of Education has done a very interesting project uh, called Turning the Tide, which is about, um, it, it's an attempt to deal with the pressure around college admissions, and, the, and especially the kind of achievement pressure uh, that our students feel, I think, um, in prep schools, uh, independent schools all throughout Washington. And so how do we rethink the life of a student um, so that we're telling them uh, through our actions what values, mo what, 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 what they should value. There's Robert Weisbord, or Richard Weisbord, who is um, at Harvard and is the chair of this project, wrote a book called The Parents We Mean to Be. And I think that when we talk as parents, um, we are always concerned about our kids being good people, right? That's what I hear that all. I want, to, I want my kid to be a good person. I want my kid to be happy. What Weisbord has found is that even though we're saying that, and I think that we mean that, right? I don't think people are being disingenuous about that. What kids are hearing is that academic achievement matters most and that ethics are far less important. And that's not the world we want our kids to live in. So how do we continue to maintain the sense of academic excellence while allowing kids more space to consider ethical questions um, and to demonstrate to them that they have power over the world, that they can actually change the world, that we can imbue them with a kind of sense of hope uh, which I think is a very important and empowering thing for us to do, and I think that this center gives us a possibility to do that. Yeah. And also, I think part of what the plan is speaking to is how do we ensure that as many uh, uh, kids as possible have that opportunity? Right. And that gets to kind of the fourth pillar, which is ensuring that we're welcoming a wider community. I wonder if you could talk a little bit to kind of what that means to you and to this plan. Well, one of the, what, what, when I was interviewing for the position, um, Someone asked me, you know, what, what, what's your feeling about financial aid? And I kind of chuckled because I said, well, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for financial aid. Um, I would not have gone to uh, college. I would not have gone to graduate school without financial aid. So I'm deeply committed to that. And we should be as a friend school. Accessibility is a key pillar um, for any friend school. We have a long, friend schools have a 250-year, 300-year tradition of providing financial aid to our schools. Um, from the very beginning, meetings provided scholarships um, for students who could not afford to attend Quaker schools. So that's woven deeply into our, our DNA. Uh, it's become, as I mentioned, this is, this is not a problem that is divorced from um, the issue of recruiting faculty. DC is a very expensive place to live. Um, tuitions have risen um, dramatically at independent schools over the last decade, over the last 15 years, actually. And so how do we find a way to curb um, our dependence on tuition dollars in the budget? We're about 85, 80 to 85% dependent upon tuition revenue. The only way to, to um, uh, reduce that dependency is to raise more endowment. Um, we at, at Sidwell Friends have 
an endowment that many schools would be happy to have. Um, we ha our endowment is uh, about $52 million or um, about $40,000 of endowment per student. Uh, that puts us in the 75th percentile of all members of the National Association of Independent Schools. I joke, um, and this would include you, um, in the joke that no one says, hey, Brian, we want Sidwell to perform at the 75th percentile, right? Nobody's ever said that to me. Um, and, and so uh, a 90th percentile um, endowment for NAS would be almost twice what ours is. So if ours is 40,000, um, you're looking at about $80,000 per student. Um, for um, NAIS. So for us to reduce tuition dependency, we've got to raise endowment and we've got to raise um, uh, annual giving. Th these are the programs that um, support scholarships. Uh, so in the strategic plan, we're looking to grow endowment for two things primarily. One is for scholarships, the second is for faculty salaries. Um, the other, the other um, program or uh, initiative within this particular pillar is to help people understand that Quaker schools are not hostile to philanthropy. That in, in fact, every Quaker school, everyone, has depended upon philanthropy, um, whether it's through gifts of land, through gifts of endowment. Um, I was mentioning this 300-year tradition um, of uh, financial aid uh, that we have um, in Quaker schools. The last Quaker school that I worked at, Wilmington Friends School, had um, uh, in 1754 established its first endowment fund for scholarships. Sidwell has come late to the endowment game in part because um, we were owned by Thomas Sidwell. Mm -hmm. uh, it was his school and it wasn't until the 1930s um, when he established a board of trustees and became a nonprofit that we even began to begin to think about endowment. Um, but, but um, friends have always given generously um, to, to organizations. Friends who did well, Quakers who did well, um, and there's a long list of uh, Quakers who were very successful in business. This is also something that isn't necessarily understood. Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania is named after a Quaker. The Macy's, the Cadbury family, Barclays Bank. Um, these are all Quaker institutions. And when they made their wealth, they had a, an obligation they felt that was um, communicated to them through the meetings that they were to give generously uh, to organizations that represented their values. So um, the schools are, are um, you know, that's one place where people invested. Uh, Swarthmore College, uh, Quaker College, of course, Bryn Mawr, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, Cornell, Ezra Cornell was Quaker. They were very much interested in investing in education because they thought, like William Penn, that that represented um, the future of the country. And I think we're in that same place now. And we, want, we, we believe that we, uh, our, our values as a Quaker school are more relevant now than they've ever been. And it's important for us to maintain accessibility, both by keeping tuition down and by offering scholarships uh, to as many people as we're able to do that. that the, the scholarships also enable us to get the most qualified people here, mm. right? Um, it, it's not, most qualified doesn't, it does not mean um, uh, ability to pay. We want the most qualified students regardless of ability to pay. And, that, and that's one of the things that makes us a very special institution. Um, the peer experience here, and you would speak to this too as an alum, the teachers are incredibly influential. But what happens in that classroom, the quality of dialogue that happens in, in the classroom, the quality of the interaction that you have on the athletic field, um, the quality of um, uh, the uh, uh, students who are in the play with you really matters and shapes the experience in a deeply profound way. So being able to assemble a diverse community here uh, uh, across every spectrum, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, getting the best students who are open to friends' values is a crucial part of our mission, and that's why endowment is so important. Sure. There was a, a story that was related about, you mentioned William Penn and Penn Charter, and you know, there seems to be, or what, I'm, what I've heard quite often is that there's a, um, there's a tension between Quakerism or 
a, a supposed tension between Quakerism and giving, or Quakerism and philanthropy, but William Penn to help ensure that all kids who, who wanted to go to his school, Penn Charter, could go there, basically instructed his friends to help pitch in for, That's for right. these individuals. I mean, this, is, this sounds to me like the spirit yeah. of what we're going yeah. for here. Well, they saw it as a responsibility, yeah. right? Um, and uh, many of those schools uh, sought to, uh, were, were founded expressly to um, educate the poor of the neighborhood. And in many cases, um, they were established to um, educate the poor of the neighborhood regardless of race. Now, they weren't, they didn't create integrated schools, um, but they recognized the power of education. Um, and Penn, in particular, recognized the power of education for Pennsylvania, for his colony, that there needed to be um, a very, uh, a, a place where cosmopolitan thinkers uh, could come together and um, learn the skills that they would need to be uh, successful citizens of his colony. Uh, and, and we see that we're doing that in a way for the nation right now, in the nation's capital. We think that we have a particular uh, responsibility around that. And uh, it's very exciting to have all these opportunities and to have so many people involved in the process, uh, faculty, um, alumni, parents, it's really been uh, terrific and in many cases very humbling because uh, it's extraordinary to see how deeply people care about the school. For sure, for sure. I mean yeah. from our standpoint as an alumni board it's kind of a, it's an outstanding time to be a member simply because with this plan it has called out specific opportunities for alums to really make a contribution. We're forming task forces to look at the ways that we yeah. engage with one another, that we engage with the school, yeah. that we think about yeah. philanthropy and giving. But as a parent as well, I think there are so many opportunities here that will ensure that this campus and the student body and the community as a yeah. whole really uh, make sure that as it moves forward, it's really adhering to the yeah. principles that you know Thomas Sidwell put forth when he, when he built this school. Well, it's a remarkably generous community. I mean, people give in all kinds of ways. They give through their time, they give through their talent. Um, they support the school financially, and uh, you know this is a very ambitious plan. Uh, we are um, hoping to um, uh, start the building uh, within um, a, a three to four year window, um, but it's all dependent upon our ability to raise money um, to, to start to unify the campus. Uh, and it, it's a very exciting proposition. We've got faculty, uh, right now working on a master plan to uh, design what the building would look like um, and uh, we're not planning to change the exterior footprint of the building in any way. Um, we're planning to refurbish uh, the building that's part of our, our um, charge of environmental stewardship. Uh, we're not trying to build the Taj Mahal. Uh, we're trying to build uh, you know places that will really, for, for upper school in particular, um, create new opportunities for learning, more uh, ample spaces. One of the things that we have right now, are we have very small science labs. This um, opportunity at the Washington Home will enable us to have uh, science labs that um, uh, meet the standards of uh, uh, many, uh, for example, um, Maryland, uh, Montgomery County public schools. We just need to make them a little bit bigger. We don't have the same kind of uh, capacity in an upper school um, that was built for uh, 450 students and now houses 510, 515. So the opportunity to have more space both for learning but also more social space for students. Uh, I, I always thought, you and I probably when we were in college probably spent most of our time in a cubicle. Um, I don't know, that's I'll speak for myself. <laughs> when I studied. <laughs> well, I probably had to work harder than you but I, I wasn't a Sidwell student, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, now it's a much more social process and, and technology has changed the way students learn uh, to a certain extent. So we want to be able to have spaces that allow them uh, to learn collaboratively and, and to use the tools that they become accustomed to and we're not really built for that right now. The building was built in 64 uh, so we have some work to do. So and before closing I'm sure we've got members of the community who are listening in who are eager to learn how they can help, how they can pitch in, how they can learn more, kind of what's next and what can members of our community do? Well, certainly we'd love to hear a response to the plan. 
Uh, parents uh, will have an opportunity on uh, November 14th to hear uh, me speak about the plan uh, in more detail. Uh, Mei Liang, who chaired the steering committee uh, and who chaired the entire strategic planning process and is on the Board of Trustees and is also a current parent, will be there as well to um, speak about the board process around this. Uh, we're having a board retreat this weekend where we'll spend a lot of time talking about the plan and, and its implementation. Uh, and, and ask questions and, and, um, and continue to be involved in every way um, that parents and alumni are. Getting involved through the alumni board is a terrific service. Uh, there's so many great opportunities um, uh, to be involved uh, in the Parents Association. I just met with the Parents uh, Association Steering Committee today and uh, you know, I think about the help that they um, have uh, lended us on the uh, lower school principal search and being involved on, uh, you know, a group of parents that organized themselves to be an advisory committee for that. That's being helpful. Um, thinking about ways that uh, they might want to become involved and opening opportunities um, for student leadership. Uh, we have, for example, this wonderful program, and, and you came to one of the luncheons for this, the DeHasia Internship Program, uh, a program that um, uh, Mac DeHasia endowed uh, about 10 or 15 years ago for his son Aninja who passed away. Aninja was a student here and um, benefited enormously from internships at NIH. And so what Mac has done ha is um, he has funded some internship opportunities um, for our juniors here uh, that have been very meaningful for them uh, during the summer of their junior year. Where they worked, some have worked in nonprofits, some have worked at investment firms. But it's an ability for or an opportunity for those students to get some hands-on experience. Al alumni and parents can help by sharing those kinds of opportunities with us, saying, I'd be happy to take an intern. I'd be happy to work with somebody for a senior project. Um, it's about connecting people in the, in the service of um, the institution and to help our kids. Um, we're also, um, the financial support is always welcome, um, supporting the annual fund. And when um, we'll be um, calling people to ask them uh, to help with this project, and uh, people can be very helpful by uh, agreeing to meet with us and taking the call and learning more about the plan and, and why it's important to the school at this moment. Great. Anything else you'd like to add? Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate the conversation. I appreciate your time. I appreciate everybody else tuning in, and um, please feel free to email us. Um, I hope to see you at the uh, parent event on uh, November 14th. And I just want to express my gratitude for your interest and in all that you do for Sidwell Friends School. Thanks.